Li Shangjing, Master Jia. The palace sought sages, recalled the exiled statesman, Master Jia, whose talents were beyond all others. How sad, at midnight, when he moved his mat closer, the emperor asked not about men, but about ghosts. So, this is the seventh and last poem of uh, Li Shangjing in this section and the last of his poems in the anthology. And it's a poem that reminds me a lot, well, not a lot, but probably the, the Shui Palace. Uh, both of them are inspired on historical events. If the Shui Palace was a historical poem that could be read, besides the evocation of uh, luxurious but wasteful, event in the historical past and perhaps as a bleak criticism to the excesses of current rulers, Master Jia is a poem that through a figure from the past, an exemplary figure, uh, the representative of the scorned, uh, capable and wise scholar, uh, through this figure, which is supposed to be implicitly a stand-in for Li Shangjing himself, uh, the, the, the poet is again using history to criticize his own lack of preferment, his own lack of advancement. So before we continue, we need to explain the historical background. Who is Master Jia? So Jia Ji, we've encountered him, I think, in, in a few poems earlier, was a, a Chinese essayist, poet and politician from the Western Han Dynasty, the early Western Han Dynasty. So um, approximately the first, let's say, 30, 40 years of the second century before Christ. Now, Master Jia was famous because very early on he showed, uh, when he was quite young, he showed quite a lot of intelligence and talent, and he wrote some uh, memorials to Emperor Wen of the Han Dynasty, urging him to, you know, take a more active role in imperial government, to, to keep under his eye the bureaucracy and uh, the provincial governors, in, in a line that matched some legalistic principles uh, that, that he had studied. And, uh, and a teacher who had been a disciple of, uh, I think, the great legalist scholar, uh, Li Su. Now, uh, the, the, it's difficult, nevertheless, to pinpoint the ideology of, of Jia Ji, because uh, in the early Han period, Confucianism was just one of the different schools. It had not been canonized yet as the official imperially sanctioned school of thought. And uh, it was floating along with other ideologies, competing for attracting imperial interest, and probably with less success at that time than Taoism, especially of the Huang uh, Lao variety, which was, you could say, the, the semi-official orthodoxy in the court of Emperor Wen. Anyway, uh, Master Jia's sage political advice in the line of reinforcing imperial power got him some very quick promotions, but also the animosity of the more traditionalist and conservative elements of the court, who thereby managed to get him semi-exiled. Uh, so he was sent very early, uh, I think 176, to the kingdom of Changsha in what was then the remote, extreme, miasmatic and dangerous, uh, malaria-ridden south of the country, a place where one was not expected to live much. And he was sent there as a grand tutor to the king of Changsha. And there he composed some poems of lament, which became very famous, especially the poem on the owl, Fu Nao Fu, Fu Nao Fu, and, uh, and uh, uh, a couple of others, I think, maybe one on, on Chu Yuan. And uh, he later was recalled to the imperial court, uh, but he had a little bit of a famous and expert in matters of Taoist mysticism, so when he was called back to the court as, as grand tutor of one of the emperor's sons, um, he was only uh, brought to give the emperor advice on religious and mystic matters, not in the political matters of which he was a specialist, not only because of those, um, of those uh, memorials that he wrote to the emperor, but he was famous for two pieces of, 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 of political um, theory that have been preserved. Uh, one of them, The Faults of Qin, which is a, a short essay, uh, Guo Qin Lun, which basically um, set the model of, 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 of what during the Han Dynasty was the interpretation of why the brief Qin Dynasty had fallen just before the Han. 
and the, the main argument that the Confucians would would um, would would repeat over and over again that Qin was a ruthless legalistic dynasty based on harsh punishments and rewards and not on co-opting uh, one's relatives and the people's consent to rule and uh, any tyrannical government like this is meant to be short-lived. So, so that's why I was saying, even though there are many elements of legalism in uh, Jiaji's advice to the throne, the, the main message of, of this essay of his, The, the Faults of Qin, is a pretty Confucian message, you could say, a proto-Confucian. And he also had a big treatise, the Xin Shu, uh, with lots of political and educational insights extracted from the works of, of the warring states. But anyway, the emperor did not call him back for this. As we say, the emperor called him back to ask about ghosts. Uh, um, very frivolous topic. The, the Chinese believed in the supernatural, but uh, strict Confucians followed uh, one of the sayings in the Analects, uh, which says something like, the master never talked about um, natural phenomena, like uh, omens and uh, natural catastrophes, uh, rebellions and ghosts. Like, these were frivolous topics, uh, at best, they were topics on which nothing in intelligent could be said because there was no evidence. At worst, they were topics that could inspire or lead to rebellious behaviors and, uh, and, and, and political chaos. So the fact that in this poem we get, you know, the, the, the scholar is recalled. That's the first couplet, which seems, if, if you don't know the story, or, or, or it seems to be positing or to be preparing for a positive end, like the emperor needs uh, to find scholars and he brings the greatest of them all. But the second couplet, you know, like uh, like in a joke, <laughs> it, it, it turns around, uh, it subverts this first story by saying, yeah, he was called back, but only for talking about foolish things and not for giving the great advice he could give for better managing the empire. So Master Jia was frequently associated with another figure from the war late Warring States period, Chu Yuan, who we've already talked about also, who both have in common, and that's the topic of one of, uh, one of his poems, one of Jia Ji's poems, The Lament for Chu Yuan, uh, both have in common the fact that they were, they were, um, or they considered themselves, themselves, wise and loyal counselors to their sovereigns, but both were ignored. Uh, their advice was not taken into account. Their virtue was not recognized by their sovereign, and so they died sad and miserable and unable to help in the administration and rulership of the empire or the kingdom. So what's the topic of this poem? It's a historical poem. It recreates the figure of Master Jia and uh, the complaint that he was not employed. The anecdote of the poem is just a short part, a short part of Master Jia's biography, the moment when he is recalled to the capital, but not for given any important political positions or asked advice on serious political matters. As I said in, in the intro, I think the indirect topic of the poem seems to be um, Li Shangjing's complaint that he is a bit like Master Jia. Uh, his own merit and his capacity for being a positive political figure is not taken into account. And that's it. Uh, by the way, I, I should comment that in, in the notes to this poem, it is mentioned that this poem is attributed to Li Shangjing, but others also attributed to Du Mu, uh, which would also match uh, what we've been telling about him as a, and of most uh, late Tang poets, as frustrated scholar officials who expected be given important positions, but because of living in a time of decadence and corruption, did not have their merit, their virtue recognized. Okay, let's take a look at the poem couplet by couplet. As I said before, the first couplet really presents the story of the return. And uh, because of the Sasura, uh, it, 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 it does not give away, it, well, all, all, all people reading the story would have known the whole the whole, the whole anecdote. But mm, for any other reader, you know, the first couplet really sets up a scenario that looks pretty optimistic. That is, the emperor recalls the, the exiled scholar official because he is searching for worthy people. So first couplet, the palace sought sages, recalled the exiled statesman, Master Jia, whose talents were beyond all others. So the poem starts in this auspicious note. The emperor needs advice. It was uh, very typical of, uh, of Han emperors, you know, to ask the provinces or or, or important bureaucrats to present people to the emperor for service in the, bureau in the bureaucracy, worthy people. 
In this case, it's the recalling of an exiled person. We know, if, if you know the historical anecdotes, that in theory, for no fault of his own, and he's being sent back to the capital because, you know, why smart people like him, talented people are necessary. What are they going to be employed in? That's what the second couplet tells us, and it's a, a pretty disappointing line. How sad, at midnight, when he moved his mat closer, the emperor asked, not about men, but about ghosts. So at night, uh, the scholagia is brought into the imperial presence. Um, mats are mentioned because in, in this period, I think until the Song dynasty, almost a thousand years after, um, after the, uh, the, the, the after Master Jia, uh, only during the Song, I said, chairs with a back became popular amongst uh, the Chinese elite. So before that, uh, even the aristocracy basically sat in the floor on, on mats, uh, sitting in a certain formal position that the Japanese still preserve for ritual and serious occasions, which is called seiza, like with your knees bent. So the mat is being brought closer, that is, the scholar official is being placed close to the emperor so that he will be able to chat and engage with him. But the emperor asks only about frivolous topics, about ghosts, about uh, the supernatural, which, as I said, was a very popular topic in Chinese uh, literature from pretty early on. The first, uh, first gleamings of fiction are basically stories of the supernatural, which were popular in the, uh, in the, in the period of the Qiwai, I think is the name of the genre. They were popular in the period of Disunion and later also in the, the Tang Chuanqi and the, in, in the Tang uh, short stories. Uh, the theme of supernatural, of the supernatural of ghosts and and uh, transmuting monsters was pretty popular, but it always had this sort of Confucian stigma of frivolity and uh, and uh, and um, deceitfulness at, at depicting things that do not necessarily exist or do not have sufficient evidence. Uh, so that's it. So uh, historical poem: the lack of recognition of the talented person. That is a, a very very common, almost conventional idea in scholar-official poetry, but pretty well treated in this historical reenactment.